and in building living institutions. And it's kind of like it biomimicry inspired. Um, so uh, yeah, who am I? Uh, oh, this is an old slide, but uh, in the past I was a co-organizer with Civic Tech Toronto, which was a thing like tonight. Um, this is me on this place in GitHub, and this place in Twitter. I think Twitter still exists, and then that's where I am on Gmail. Um, and then I thought, like, <coughs> for introduction, it feels like since I like care about networks, and that kind of plays into like the talk, I like to do an introduction based on like who I am within networks uh, to kind of share that way of knowing me. So. Uh, who am I in relation to those I, I'm here with or who aren't here? Um, and so I guess I kind of take that from the point of like, what am I at the center of? And then later on the next, what am I at the beginning or the, the in-between of? So the identities I'm at the center of is I'm white, male, technologist, I'm a tech person, uh, I'm a Canadian and Westerner, I'm kind of thoroughly entrenched in there. Uh, and I'm also a biochemist, uh, I'm excited, I'm able-bodied, like these are the things that I'm kind of in the middle of and maybe sometimes can't see outside of. And, and then what are the things that I feel between that maybe, uh, you know, the thing I, I feel the between this is something where whenever I find it or notice it, I feel privileged to, to, to do it because you get to kind of see two different worlds. Um, and so I'm between community organizer and technologist, which don't, it's not, these aren't necessarily poles, but they're just things that don't tend to, they don't always overlap. Uh, government and open source culture are very kind of different sorts of cultures. Uh, I've never really felt at home growing up in like, male culture or like, like hyper masculine culture and uh, I think maybe didn't realize that until I was a little a little older. Um, and I just like, yeah, was, many of my friends are, are women and not or went through phases where they're just friends with women. Um, and uh, biological and technological perspectives often don't kind of overlap, but I think I have both of those. And, and yeah, my, my Canadian identity is kind of this contradictory, odd national identity where it's like there's a lot of it's like we have a coherent identity, but we're actually really focused on welcoming newcomers as like a collective, which is kind of interesting. And then I'm also between civic tech communities. I kind of popped around between maybe 10 cities, uh, lived there for a few months at a time. Uh, okay, so first off, context setting, because like I have a biochemistry background, but this is like a little, uh, uh, I, like you are here. This is in an armchair. This is very armchair speculation. It's not like, I'm not, this is like a real fully sighting scientist. Maybe like I'm bringing my art brain to my science background. Uh, so just like caveat this. Uh, so the goals of this talk will be to like kind of share a leading hypothesis for the origins of biological life, which some people might find interesting. Um, share a little primer on complexity science, and I don't have enough slides for as many slides for that as I want to, but maybe I'll, uh, yeah, so I'll see how that goes. Um, and uh, yeah, and the, the idea is that this field kind of gives permission to take learnings from biological science and maybe apply them to, to, a, a little, to social science in a fuzzy, artsy, armchair sort of way, and then provoke some thoughts. And so this is a real loose goal, just, just send it out there. Uh, so this is a paper that kind of uh, originally introduced me to this like line of thinking. Um, uh, the paper discusses lots of other things, but kind of there was a particular set focus of, of it. Um, uh, yeah, the paper is a uh, Hans Kuhn and its origin life symmetry breaking in the universe, the emergence of like virality. All of that is, all those words are not super important. Uh, but there's kind of like uh, a part of it where they, yeah, they, they summarize kind of what um, are the requirements for biological life. Whereas in, it's really common to like be in these, when I was in my degree, the way we talked about these was, uh, oh, you need to have lipids first, or you needed to have RNA, which is a precursor to DNA, but like it was very focused on the molecules and like the things that life was actually built up of. But um, kind of reading this much later after I was into, um, kind of out of the biological science and in the, uh, into more of the social science community organizing space, um, I found this, the approach of this paper or what they, what they shared in it was interesting. They basically said the requirements for biological life, if we're just fuzzing our eyes and not looking at the actual like material, is that we need to have uh, periodicity in time. Um, the first thing we need to have compartmentalization or like kind of, you know boundaries, little like, spaces that things can be in, and and then we need to have uh, structural microdiversity. And these mean very certain things in the biological world. And maybe I'll, I'll try to generalize them after, um, and maybe allow people to kind of. Buzz their understanding. So the periodicity, uh, aka cycles, um, kind of in the biological sense, the, the kind of root of the cycles is often orbital. Like there's many cycles in this living world that we're in. There's like, yeah, like tides. There's like uh, this kind of uh, growth and death cycles. There's seasons. There's a lot of living cycles, but like 
the original cycles are the those that come from orbital mechanics of like kind of thing moving around another thing. And the kind of example they give in the paper is like imagine the, the way cycles would be experienced as a like a necessary precursor for the origin of life is that you have like a rock, a fucking rock. <laughs> and then you have a shadow. And the shadow is growing and shrinking. And you've got this little space that isn't moving that's getting hotter and colder and hotter and colder. And like and then so you you know there's processes of like hot heat cool heat cool um, and like that is important for the gen yeah that's important uh, to be a, a site of action for like kind of the, the changing of molecules the growth the like combining of things new reactions moving between two phases um, and so uh, the second thing is compartmentalization or boundaries in the biological sense like much later in a very well developed biological organism this is like a fossil lip and bilayer which you may have heard about. Um, and but kind of like when you again the fuzzy speak is that you essentially a compart compartments allow you to have um, particularly at the compartments exist within a cell for example um, they exist within a living multicellular organism a body like your um, uh, but like maybe the easiest way to think about this is um, the compartments uh, like the, the outer layer of the cell the cellular membrane. And, and this allows the cell to choose what is it and what is not it. What gets to be inside of me and what gets what does is not included. Um, so it's like really kind of like it's choosing what is self and what is not self. And like the ability to have that boundary allows that control, um, which is super important to be like a coherent thing that life, the sort of agent that life is. Um, and then the third thing, microdiversity and at the cellular level. This one I find the hardest to to grasp or draw analogies with, but um, but like yeah, it's essentially like you need kind of um, you need kind of chaos. You need like different structures to like um, like you need to be able to harvest information about the external environment. Um, like there's basically like like uh, diversity of structure allows lots of like choice, allows lots of um, uh, and allows lots of things and patterns to select from. With which to choose, like the the future things that help an organism navigate the world. Basically, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's definitely part of it. Um, any, I don't know, any questions? I should pause for a sec because I'm gonna speak too quick. I don't know. Is this like, or just like call, like, ah, oh, this is bullshit. That also isn't. That's not a question, <laughs> but I'll accept that. Uh, okay, so yeah, that's kind of mostly I was focusing on the biological realm, but then the kind of uh, bridge thought crack is like, this is really the only slide that, oh, there's also, this, this, this is the only slide we'll get for complexity science. So I'm sorry there's not any visual aids on this, but um, complexity science is kind of, I would say like the way I like to describe it, which is maybe armchair, is that complexity science is this worldview that like kind of the world is made of networks, that like the interactions between things are really important. And, and it kind of has a, I guess I often, I'm noticing there's a metaphor I use a lot of like kind of eye crossing fuzziness, like this idea of like blurring, like kind of, you know, squinting and maybe being able to see something like something else in another thing. And, and I feel like complexity science is like this <clears throat> field that, allow, that gives you a kind of well grounded, mathematically grounded permission to do that. It basically says, it, it, it kind of studies networks in the form of cities, in the form of biological organisms, in the form of populations, in the form of like, org charts, and, and it kind of tries to find the kind of laws and rules and patterns and structures, like the shapes within that, that, that might be common between. Um, so it lets you, it's like the study, it allows you to see um, kind of the generalized patterns in all networks that, that tell you a little bit about how information wants to move or, or succeeds in moving in the world. Um, so, and it doesn't matter what those networks, in many ways, like you can kind of not pay too much attention to what those networks are made of, the substrates that they're made of, and, and kind of understand that they're just, they're information moving in the world, and, and they're just made of different things, but there's kind of things you can learn that can cross between them. And things you learn about a biological system can apply to a social system, because like, that biological system has run fucking trillions of, I just spit really far there, that was, sorry, <laughs> uh, like a trillion permutations, whereas in our society, a company, you know, business cycles have maybe run less. So uh, we can look at the system where information has per permuted through many, many cycles 
and learn something about the smaller ones. Did you have a question? No, it's no, it's about you. <laughs> Nitpicky or semantic to me. But I would argue that if we talk about complexity in science, we don't necessarily have to talk about networks. Like, mm -hmm. You could have a predator prey system, which is like a couple differential equations that produces complex behaviors and could be described as a complex system, but you don't have to model it as a network. And maybe in reality is a network, but we could look at it just from a mathematical perspective as like two differential equations. And okay. we don't care. Like, I mean, I don't care, or many complexity scientists might not care if it's so the two, agents are connected in an actual network. Uh, this is very nippy. No, no, no. It's like, um, <clears throat> yeah, it, it, interestingly, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of, uh, some, a word that gets talked a lot is like, Agent based models where, and yeah. this is again, I'm in my armchair here. Uh, it's kind of an understanding of this system where usually the agents are kind of independent and working and have their own simple rules and they're interacting. And you might have two different sorts, and um, it's something more complex than any of the agents emerges. From that. My question was so, two divergent the question on map I saw it in the street. Um, well, like there's like the famous model, like lock of terror equations, which is the predator prey system, which involves like <clears throat> okay, it's an abstraction of like predator, predators and prey could be like <clears throat> rabbits and wolves or whatever, but it doesn't matter. It's just two simple different equations that have sort of complex <laughs> behaviors when you <clears throat> let's say run, not even run a simulation, but just like do do the math of those equations, and so. And there's like many different examples of this, like, I mean, like sort of chaos theory or like the Mandelbrot row set or something. It's just, a, it would still be described as like a complex system, but it doesn't necessarily have to be an agent-based model of that system. It could okay. be just a mathematical abstraction, um, if that makes sense. Okay, no, that makes sense. I'll... But so I would just say it doesn't necessarily have to be, like if you look at this word bubble, okay, network is in there, but I think it's more important things like yeah, oscillation. You can have an oscillating system, like the, the predator prey model, for example, the lock triple terror model. Yeah, is an oscillate. It does produce oscillations just from this, these simple differences. Okay, so it could just be a mathematical model. It doesn't yeah. need to be like an actual structured network. Where, yeah. Oh, these things make, are connected this way. You can make an agent-based model of yeah. the predator prey system, mm -hmm. but you could also just abstract it mathematically and not have agents okay. and not have a network. Thank you. Cool. Yeah. So yeah. ten minutes. Yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah. I guess I'm seeing seven times, but I, I didn't think uh, so. Yeah, I guess, uh, like, maybe this is like super like the application of the institution is like, I, I think like I found this to be a neat framework through by a lot, like initially I've done a lot of like dropping into like nonprofits and not dropping into other communities and dropping into like organizations and like, like I think I like, uh, I'm a little stochastic. I move around a bit and have had the chance to like kind of end up in spaces for a short time and, and I found it to be a neat, the, the kind of, this uh, this way of looking for these. So I guess one piece I didn't I didn't share is that like the uh, maybe a belief of some folks who practice complexity science is that um, you know we talk about life. The, the, there's many people in this field interested in understanding the bounds of what life is, and there's some folks who work with collect complexity science who kind of have this view that like life is like kind of a Things, it's, things can be life-like, and there's not, like, we think of a cell as life and, like, a company as not life, um, but that some have the view that, like, these are all, like, um, that there is something, that things that are not biologically living can have, like, some of these properties of life, and, like, they can act like living things for, as far as, like, you know, the informa how information is moving in the world. Like, the universe, we feel like we are made of very different things, but, like, maybe from an uh, like step back perspective of like information in the universe, the universe doesn't really care about the difference between the information in our ideas, the information in our companies, and the information in our like physical biology that we feel is very solid, but like information moving in the universe doesn't really, that distinction is not, it doesn't perhaps matter as much. So I, I, I guess like, uh, yeah, so the, the idea is like if you imagine kind of the things that we build together as humans as kind of living things as well, then you can kind of interestingly, I think, apply some of these uh, thoughts to like understand the strengths or weaknesses of the institutions or communities or 
uh, organizations that you come into. And um, so the examples uh, I would give is, yeah, these are like often the questions I would kind of ask myself and, um, and kind of like just be like really ruthless in looking for like, like you're just looking for absences of these things. Like, uh, so I, that's how I apply this. So like what you're trying to find like the, the per a cycle I kind of would think of it as like, it's like a cycle is a little, like when you go through a cycle, uh, an agent like ourselves has, can, or like a cell can, is that, can understand that as like an experiment. You're getting to see, you can kind of A-B test between each cycle and you can have, it's a, it's a spot of learning. So like it's neat to kind of recognizing where the cycles and flows are in um, say a, a community or an organization, and if it's lacking them, it's like perhaps a sign that like there's like any, you know, to put a really lifelike word, there's an illness, there's something that could be improved. And it's not just like, yeah, I feel like you're kind of looking for as many nested cycles and like kind of trying to be creative with looking for them. And then imagining, oh, there's a thing that's not, there's no cycles here, how could this be a, a cyclical process or flow? Um, uh, I mean, I'm trying, yeah, like even like uh, the hack night thing, like the weekly, the, the, the cycle of the weekly rhythm, the way like projects like arise and die, the, like the fact that like the way that you retain people when a project dies and fails, like that people like cycle into a new thing instead of like, you know, flying off into the universe because like the project failed. Um, so yeah, it's like uh, kind of like matter and temporal cycles, I guess. Anyway, um, so this is where, this is super arm wavy because I can't wave you guys, but but I found it very practical and grounding and uh, often unstuck a lot of situations and just like, like people like open up and they're like, oh, like we're, there's there's a framework here that comes from life and like, and, and it kind of unsticks people and helps them see opportunities. So where are the boundaries? Um, yeah, that's like kind of, even like this, this Elle does neat thing, like the, she actually goes out into the streetscape at the, during these nights and actually pulls people in and creates like these permeability between spaces and kind of seeing where like not just physical boundaries, but like conceptual boundaries or uh, kind of social boundaries are, and like kind of trying to like, um, you know, have control of what passes through, either passes through or stays outside. That's like also a, a thing. Um, so what are the boundaries of that? I would say like there's a lot of conceptual. It's like I, I mean in Toronto we kind of talk about this idea of like when someone starts using the pronoun we to describe the thing that they're doing, and so like that's a yeah, oh, it's like a, a real, like, like the, it's almost like a metric, you can kind of, like, the time to we, like, someone, they came their first time, and then they're, like, there's a, in a community space, when someone is like, they, 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 they should do this, like, that person should do that, that's, you're outside a conceptual boundary, but as soon as you start using we, you are inside one, and that's, like, an interesting boundary transition. Um, yeah, I think a lot of it is language, and, yeah, I, I understand a lot of the boundaries as psychological and language like that are most interesting. Um, the, the boundaries of the physical space of Newspeak doesn't, like this place where we are, doesn't necessarily matter that much. Although, you know, pulling someone into the building is a really, like, like it's an intervention that, that works really well, as I think Al demonstrates often. Um, and, uh, sorry, my laundry's done. Um, I and then I have one minute left. <laughs> one minute. Uh, and this one I find, like, there's a whole other, I, I think I, this kind of comes up. There's, like, kind of a shallow point at diversity of, of kind of visible and invisible measures, like, as, uh, that I think can be taken, and it's almost like token diversity, whereas in, like, and I don't have time for this, but there's, like, um, yeah, there's some fields of social physics um, that kind of talk about uh, diversity of thought, diversity of experience, which is kind of a subset of the thought, which your experience is formed, or the thoughts you bring to uh, <laughs> the space of, of humans. But um, yeah, that, uh, that essentially say, like, we should think of this like an ecology that, like, you know, the more diversity you preserve as a, in an archive and you kind of hold um, within reach uh, like of an ecosystem, the stronger it is, the more resilient it is. And I, I guess I would. I, yeah, the way I kind of transfer this institutional health is like just like yeah, diversity of thought and diversity of experience, and not not necessarily always like bringing it in, but like maintaining like routes and access to it. Like, um, and I think in some the field of social physics, there's a lot of talk about kind of they study well teams that meet their shared goals together, and they find like in many different kind of neat experiments that like the teams that have access to diverse sources of thought 
Um, and usually that is through lived experience, but not, you know, it can be anything. Um, then those teams are actually better able to kind of like work through the, the, the permutations of things that allow them to like uh, reach their goals better. Um, whereas then when you have a less diversity of thought, you, you kind of have a smaller set of ideas that are like mingling around with each other and you, you're, you're less likely to find the, the kind of combination that, uh, that is the, the optimal. Uh, okay, I think I'm at 20, yeah, 20 minutes. That's, I didn't think I'd go that long. Sorry, y'all. Oh. I totally forgot. I, I didn't factor in Q&A time. And if you have one question, and then if uh, people want to talk more on that, we can break off session. Yeah, that's great. One question for the generous. So what's your main message? Like, we should... Kind of follow these principles to make organizations more. I think it's uh, just uh, sorry, kind of like resilient, regenerative, something. I think yeah, it's like if you trust, if you feel like if you're you're interested about mimicry and you trust the processes by which life arrives at things, then it might be neat to ask questions that kind of revolve around those same three processes that were critical to life emerging. In biological systems because they might allow but whatever way you want to take it life to emerge in the larger systems that you're part of um which i that's very fuzzy and hand wavy but i would say just like a property of life is continuity it's finding what's the goal oh. with like organizational design for governance <clears throat> let's say working trying to navigate the environment uh, uh to persist to find the best set of means, ideas, practices to persist in an ever-changing social milieu. Um, yeah, I don't know. Is that I mean, good enough? The way I see it, and take this from like a smooth brain, I probably have missed the deeper meaning here, but the cycles, for, so the <clears throat> application that my organization runs, we monitor projects and services, so the cycle is a project or a service, the boundaries are the boundaries between the duty bearers, so the people responsible for delivering public goods, the constructors, the people making the goods, the people receiving those goods, and anybody in between. And the diversity of any sort is the diversity of opinions and data that people are gathering and they share together to arrive at a communal decision, essentially. That's just like the practical application. It's probably missing like I think the project cycles, yeah? <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Because I thought, when I thought when I was listening to Cycles, I thought that maybe there are like rhythms, different rhythms, which is also like a big part of the nature. Or maybe it's feedback loops, which is also yeah. really important. Yeah, uh, yeah. So like you, know, you can interpret cycles in different ways. Yeah, maybe just permission to be kind of laser focused on these three things and trying to like create more and more dimensions of them, I, I guess. It's like, it's just, un or understand them better. Um, it's not super prescriptive. Uh, <clears throat> I would also, I mean, my take, based on what you've said so far, is that like, also living systems are typically, or generally, like one definition of like what constitutes a living system would, would be like self-replication, like <clears throat> things that systems that are capable of persisting over time. Sometimes doesn't mean permanently, like every species species might go extinct or whatever, but generally, it's like something that is able to replicate itself and persist through time. On its own, based on its own internal mechanisms, um, and I think that would apply to many like complex systems mm -hmm. as well, like both living and um, so yeah, I was, I was like, that would be like nice. but that's well, not necessarily, but that's what. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Matthew. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? And yeah, thanks. I uh, sorry, we're going a little bit over, but thank you. <laughs> thank you.